Hey, everybody, this is Jeff Peterson, and this is the Interstate of Music podcast. And with me today is a very, very good friend of mine and somebody that I've gotten to know uh, through multiple projects. Uh, he is the lead vocalist and the, the creator of the band Title Holder, which is an amazing uh, band. You've, you've released some great stuff that I'm a big I'm a big ska guy. I love the music. I love the style, the genre. Um, and, but I've also gotten to know him initially as the, uh, a vocalist, uh, as well as the bass player for the band Card Reader that won the 2021 uh, 20, uh, Interstate Music Awards, uh, yeah. and, and which, is, which is super exciting. So I've gotten to see him play. I've gotten to know him personally. Uh, I, I've, I've had him on a previous podcast with Card Reader, so I got to know a little bit about that project and that journey. But you know what, Matt? What I haven't gotten a chance to do is find out a little bit more about you personally. And uh, I want to get to it. So welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's good to virtually be back in that <laughs> wonderful room. <laughs> right. This is a wonderful room. And you've got quite so the cool. setup. Dude, you've got a setup there. I mean, this isn't like a typical, like, what the hell you got going on right there? I don't mess around. I don't know if you've you heard, but like I'm gonna do the music thing full time. So, yeah, yeah this, it, this is my little home studio setup that I do all my demos for for you know all things title holder and me and Tom in the band Card Reader. We we work out a lot of stuff here too. So I'm I'm constantly working and moving and grooving, and I don't mess around. <laughs> so no, you clearly you clearly do not. So here is here's what I want to know a little bit more about is. It, you say you do the music thing full time and you've got these different projects and you obviously know a lot about, you know, self producing, you know, as far as some of the, the music that you do. And it, you know, from what I've been able to pick up through kind of following you socially, you lay down your own tracks, you, you play you multiple instruments and all that kind of thing as well. When did that all start for you? Were you always like, I'm going to be in the music industry this is my dream. This is my life. I, I'm going to make money doing it. What were your thoughts like all the way back to when you were in grade school, high school, you know, college, if you went type of thing, where was, where was your head? I, I think from the time that I was born until like 14, I wanted to be a professional hockey player. And then when I discovered like pop punk and newfound glory and good Charlotte and bands like that, that were kind of like on the rise in 2000, 2001, um, I immediately switched gears and was like, Oh, I don't want a hockey stick anymore. I want an electric guitar. Um, I haven't really, I can't really say like, I'm, I'm, I'm making like a lot of money off of it, but I am doing what I love. Um, but yeah, well, and, I, and, and, I, and you're I, right that it's not about it's not about the money when it comes down to passion. But I will say you went from an expensive sport to an expensive hobby slash career. <laughs> what, the oh, you, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> my parents were very supportive growing up. <laughs> yeah, that's I would say that. I, my were mom's you... like, sure, honey. We'll we'll get you that squire. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. If we don't were have you... to wake up at four a.m. for ice time anymore. I was just going to bring yeah. that up. I mean, was was it like you flipped from the four a.m. hockey practice things to the like one in the morning recording sessions? Yeah, yeah essentially. Yeah, I I mean right from the get-go when when i like decided that i wanted to like start pursuing music in that fashion i was a freshman in high school a long time ago um and i put together my own like ragtag band actually recruited a bunch of kids that i played hockey with because i saw them every weekend and i was like how cool would it be if we did this and like a bunch of kids went, jumped on board um and i rode that train all the way until like a few years after i graduated high school i was still like no, I'm not going to college. I'm going to just work at a restaurant and play in bands and do that. And then slowly I started to realize that it would be better to kind of break out from, from where I grew up in Connecticut and try to network with, you know, other, other people in other cities and stuff. And, and I moved to Boston uh, a couple of years after high school. And that's when I pursued going to school for audio engineering and recording. So, so let me, let me, let me get this straight. So the typical, I, I, you know, the stereotype, you know, and, and stereotypes are bad thing. I'm not saying, but they're, they're a thing, right? So the stereotypical <laughs> hockey player wasn't necessarily the person like that was joining the, you know, the grade school and high school band. 
you yeah. know, typically because seasons and all the rest of it, you know, once you're into something, you don't have time for something else and practice rehearsals or schedules or whatever. So if you're into hockey in grade school, did you have time or the passion to even think about starting to do the band thing once you found that, oh my gosh, I want to trade my hockey stick in for a guitar. Did you immediately go into like the band style lessons through school or was it private lessons or did you just say, I'm going to figure this thing out on my, on my own? Like what was your journey in learning how to play an instrument? When I was super little, I, I, I think I was in second grade. I, I don't remember this obviously, but my mom will never stop reminding me that i bugged the hell out of her to get piano lessons when I was like in second grade. I guess my brother was doing it and I was like, I want to do it too. So from like a very young age, I had had formal training. So you had music, piano. you had music in your life. It wasn't, it All wasn't just this random ass. I'm going from hockey to uh, right. lead guitar player and rock star. You had music in your life. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I was in fourth grade, I remember you got to, to like finally do like band class and there, you know, there was a period that was just designated to it and everybody got to sit down and you got to pick your instrument. Um, and so I had been playing piano and I was like, I'm bored of this. I don't like it anymore. And I just looked at a drum set in the corner and I was like, that's what I want. So fourth grade, I switched from piano to drums and my parents were, were just super supportive and immediately enrolled me in private lessons at a local spot um, in our town called Falsetti Music. And I would go there, you know, every Thursday at three o'clock and I would have a teacher who taught me rudiments and, and, you know, all the fundamentals and basics of not just learning like snare stuff, but also learning how to play on kit. So I did that for a while. Um, when it came time to like, I want to, you know, I want to play pop punk music in a, in a rock band. I picked up a guitar and just kind of figured it out. Like I, I, I wasn't playing chords. I was playing one note and following along on a, on a, on a video online. I think it was like right when YouTube was like starting to be a thing, but sure, there were still sure. other websites. I think like on like Napster and LimeWire and those, the Roy those Clark Lime big shirts. note guitar book. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If you remember that, I don't know if anybody remembers that. I remember that. I, so, so I, did you, did you learn to play like, was there a specific song that you're like, I want to learn this portion of this song because it would be cool. Is that kind of how it started for you? Very first song. And it was actually, it was like a live video of this band, Good Charlotte. They have a song called Motivation Proclamation. And it's like, it's super easy. It's like GCD. But that was the first one that I was like. Sounds like my grades in high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Trust me. <laughs> I looked at this video of them playing it live and I kind of worked out where they were going with it. And then I went, I remember it was like tab it or, or us tabs.com, one of those tab websites. And I was able to find like, okay, I get this. These are numbers. I understand what's going on here. And so I figured out how to play that song. And that's, that kind of just like grew into, all right, if I can figure this one out, I can figure this one out. I can figure this one out. Oh, my parents really are like big fans of Led Zeppelin. Let me learn how to play. Right. You know, so, like that was like the first, like, 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 you know, show, showing my parents how I could play that. They were like, oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Go, go back in there. Um, but that's where like kind of that all started. That is so that, that always fascinates me just because I, you know, I, I know anybody might be able to learn an instrument and do it. It's the thing that fascinates me is, is how somebody can take one aspect uh, of music lessons or learning an instrument and then transfer that over. You find so many musicians that play so many different instruments and it blows my mind. We've got a guy here, uh, Jake Miller, who, who you met. Um, he plays the drums. He's playing the trumpet. He plays the tuba. He plays the guitar. I'm like, I'm like, I like, I can turn on Spotify. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm so uh, yeah. impressed and amazed constantly by musicians and, and everything that's going on. So that, that love of music, that wanting to be in a band that, you know, did you always kind of like being, I, I don't want to, this sounds so celebrity. Did you always want to be in front of a crowd or in a spotlight to some degree? I always think that I want to, but right before i play every single time and this goes you throw, on you throw up a little bit in your mouth oh my God. <laughs> so i get so freaked out i i turn a different shade of white and i'm like 
nervous as all hell. And then right when you hit the stage in the first, you know, the first five, 10 seconds and you just feel the energy, it goes away. But I have felt that every single time I've ever performed. I remember in school band, you know, going up and I'm playing, I'm playing like a song on the marimba and like just telling myself, I'm reading the music and I'm going, you're going to drop a stick. You're going to screw this up. You're going to drop a stick. You're going to screw this up. You're going to, and then it's over and I did it, but it's all like this out of body experience. When I yes. finish playing too live, sometimes I don't remember unless there's video of it, like how I played, what I did, how I sounded. I'm just like, I'm in the moment and then it's done. I, it's, I, I love that you said that because I, I w was never a musician. I did saxophone in fourth grade for about a month. Um, and that, literally that's, that's a whole different <laughs> world. I mean, I, if you can't see your fingers, you can't, it's like, that's impossible. I don't know how they do that. I don't know how they do that. Yeah. So, but I played sports and I remember, you know, I, I, I excelled in football. I remember coming out of games at, at the varsity level in high school and I'd come out of games and I would have this, uh, this one game specifically, I was like, I could not like, I was, everything was a completion, every throw. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. I came out of that game and I couldn't remember 90% of any of those throws to even know any of them were even like open to throw the ball to. Yeah. I totally get that. And it's, and it's weird. And then later you watch film and you're like, I don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Right. And it, 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 it was because when you can be in that, in that zone side of it, but I do think the butterflies and I do think the, uh, the sweaty palms and the, just that, that, that unnerve of, of going out there and performing at anything. And it could be a, it could be a, a conference call, a zoom meeting. It could be anything. I think that's what makes people keep doing it. Oh, it scares sure. some for people sure. out. It makes it squeezes out the people that are not going to want to ever do that for a living. But the people that do it over and over, the fact that you still get those butterflies, that's the best part in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like when you, when you finish and, and you've succeeded and you, you did what you were set out to do, like just the, the level of, of how good you feel afterwards and all that adrenaline is like just unstoppable on the other end of that spectrum. The drummer that uh, we work with with Card Reader and also he drums with me in, in Title Holder Chase. Yeah, yeah. I just think he's an alien because oh, I, he, he is. He yeah. He never feels that stuff. Literally, right before we were about to go out on stage in Milwaukee, everybody was kind of like, "Oh, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready?" And I was like, "Dude, I'm kind of nervous." And he just looks at me dead in the eyes and he goes. You could just not be nervous though. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> right. He's like such a pro. I'm like, okay, whatever. But but the, some the people funny, are like that. Right. And the, the thing, the funny thing is about like when I when I got to meet Chase and I was hanging out with him, just talking with him, you could tell he was he was so about anything and everything into a conversation yeah. that and he was just bouncing from one thing to another thing to another thing and he's just like yeah i just want to go out and do it because i want to go out and do it i want to go yeah. bang on those drums i want to go play these songs i don't think he was even realizing there was going to be people there it was going to be streamed live he he was just like i just want to go hit those drums you know <laughs> it's like it's so crazy he's such a pro i love that so you know as you as you kind of went off into the music thing what pivoted, you know, your thought process into turning just being a guitar player in a band or starting a band and doing your own music into taking the more technical route of learning, the, you know, the different aspects of music. And part of that is the audio, the production, that side of it. What made you think that that was a good idea versus a distraction? I mean, it's, it, that's really good point that you say a distraction because it, it absolutely has parts of it that are absolutely a distraction. When I, I was a couple years out of high school, I'm starting a new band or I had this other band. Um, and a couple of my friends, um, specifically a friend of mine named Tim, he decided that he wanted to go to this school in Boston for audio and recording. Yep. And for one of his final projects, he hits me up and he's like, oh, Sullivan, I need you. I need you and your band to come to Boston next weekend. You're going to be my final project. I want to record you guys. And so we go to this studio in Brookline, Massachusetts uh, called Rear Window. And it is a 
mansion in a suburban neighborhood, lo- lo- like suburban looking neighborhood. Like you would never know this place was there. And you walk in and then you go into the basement and it, th- it is a like 3000 square foot, like whole setup booths, different levels, control room, everything. The guy must have millions of dollars invested into this place that he's been running for 30 plus years. And this is the studio that Tim is recording my band in. And throughout the weekend of just like really being in it and like watching it all and watching like, you know, this isn't just a a studio that I went to when I was like 15 or 16, where we hired the guy and he hit record and we did the whole thing. Like, this is a friend of mine. This is somebody I grew up with and seeing him do it really inspired me. And I was like, shit, like, I could keep like, just like sitting at home in Connecticut and not doing anything. Or I could like, I mean, Tim did it. I can do this. Right. So I, I, I hit up that school. Um, The school's called the new England Institute of art. And I enrolled very shortly after and kind of started my journey into audio and and recording. But I do still to this day, remember one of my teachers, it's like the introduction, introduction to like audio, like, you know, the physics of how sound moves and stuff like that. And it was like a production class. And he's like, this is the last day that you listen to music the same way again. Right. So right. you're, you know, as much as it, you should be excited about this, like we apologize because you're never going to listen to music the same again. And to that, to, you know, to him saying that it is absolutely 100% true. Every time I'm listening to something, I'm always like, you know, analyzing it, but which is fun. I like doing that. But now, now know. does that, did, as you've become, you know, in my opinion, a, a really up and coming songwriter, you know, has that turned, um, has that turn that distraction aspect like stifled creativity in any way, or do you think it's enhanced it? I think it's absolutely enhanced it. I, I love listening to a song and seeing the choices that people make to, you know, where they're going. You know, if, if you've got a song that is as cookie cutter as verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. You know, sometimes you hear a song where they go completely off that map of 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 your regular structure, and some of those songs are, are massive hits. Um, I I love looking into how somebody has that process. There's tons of podcasts out there where artists will do deep dives with the hosts and just talk about like the decisions that they made in the studio, and that shit inspires me so much. When I yeah. listen to like somebody else's creative process. It immediately makes me go like I gotta I gotta do something like this guy did with that song, and I'll just start working on a song right after I listen to you know somebody else's uh, approach. Sure, and and I I think you know I I think you know I I look at it as you know obviously the more well rounded you are in anything that you do, the more you know about your own product product or project. I, I think it does elevate the importance and also, you know, how passionate you can become with it instead of it just, you know, if you go in and just play it and then hope for the best for somebody to turn it into something for you, there's a little bit of like, oh gosh, I hope they don't change our sound or change the way we meant it to feel. And, you know, so I think part of it is it's, for me, I would think it's great for you to basically have a little bit more control of what the future is of, of your passion, your sound, your music, your, your lyrics and, and how it gets, gets to the consumer's ears. For sure. I mean, in, in to that point too, up until 2016, I, you know, I had been playing in other bands out in New York and I was very, I was very tunnel. Like I had a lot of tunnel vision with how my songs were being written. I, I was working with other musicians and other bands, but I was, I really kept it close to me and like, wasn't open to changes and stuff like that. I started working with this producer, Nick Brzee's. Um, He's based out of a studio in New Jersey called the Gradwell house. And that was the first time that I was like, you know what, whatever I've been doing, I feel like it could be better. And I really admire this guy's work and the bands that he's been in and the stuff that he's been putting out with other bands. Maybe it's worth a shot to listen to somebody else and take their opinions on my songs. And through working with him, I, I know that I've become a better songwriter just by like having somebody who's not emotionally attached to the music, give you their opinion on what, okay, Hey, what are you going for with this part? This pre-chorus, I feel like we could lose it. What does this lyric mean? What are you saying here? And just having somebody else kind of like put your song under the microscope and give 
the viewpoint of what the listener is going to like see and what the listener is going to hear. Um, that was a huge step for me. And then just throughout the years of trying to really practice that and continuing to work with him. Um, and then on this newest project with, with title holder, working with Chris to makes of the band less than Jake and having him co-produce these yeah. songs and have that second, that second interaction of like, all right, tell me what you're talking about. What are you going for in this song? And he would, he would literally sit there and read out my lyrics to me and go, what does this mean? And if I couldn't tell him what it meant, it's like, all right, let's, let's figure out what we're going for. Like, if you can't tell me, like, sometimes I'll just, yeah. I'll just kind of like mumble and scat lyrics so I can get something down, but I don't necessarily always know exactly where I'm going with it until I've got the full picture in front of me. Um, and that was something that they all really helped me with. So it, just your personality, what I'm hearing from you right now, and we've never had this level of conversation about, you know, your, your passion about how the music's out there, how the sound is out there, how all of that fits together. I'm starting to think that you're a big fan of collaboration versus just doing something on your own, even though you have the ability because you're uh multi-instrumental uh, and you've got all the equipment and the ability to lay down your own music and you don't in today's world, man, you can make songs all by yourself and sure. pump it out and put it out and just start to become a YouTube sensation, a TikTok sensation, doing your own thing without to ha having to have the expense of a full band, the travel, all the rest of it. That's an option. That's a thing now. Sure. And it's, and it's working. It seems like you're way more into the collaboration of the process than just being a solo self everything yeah i mean it's so much fun to like be in the room with a bunch of people like especially if the vibe is right if everybody's really on the same page and the the main objective is let's make a great song today and when you have all that energy flowing around in the room and you have that moment where everybody kind of just starts laughing like right. because they just are so into the moment and like it just feels so good like that's like a that's the feeling of getting off stage and after you just yeah, played an hour right and you know when i when i would work with nick um on these latest title holder songs you know there was a part at the end of the song uh where he's like he's like yo i know we could go right back to the last chorus but try this out and he grabbed some of the lyrics from my second verse and he was like instead of singing these start yelling them just yell them and i was like all right i'll try it i'll try it and so he hits play we hit record and then i yell this last part into the like the ending chorus and he hit he hit stop and we just start dying laughing and we're going that's it yep done dude yep that's that's the last chorus do it again let's double it and it like that that magic and that energy is is like just unbeatable for me you know and, and that's 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 one of those like those life things if if you're running a business or being a musician and you're doing everything on your own you know that collaboration it, it is where a lot of the magic happens to, to think that we can do anything on our own um you could be successful but it's also yeah. can you be successful but enjoy it as much if it's if it's just you every day pumping it out there pushing it out there do you start to, you know, deflate and have the passion kind of lose, lose it because you're so focused on just driving it instead of building something? Right, right. Totally. I mean, it, what, what's the fun if you don't have anybody to share it with? It, it's, it's true. It, that's true. You know what I mean? So here's, here's a question. And, I, and then I want to get more into um, a couple of things like your process in, in writing a song. And I want to find out more about the title holder project project and what you've got going and where you want to go with it but real quick on the on the audio side being learning that skill set was it a little bit of realizing if you're going to keep doing live music and being in a band you know kind of like the starving artist type philosophy that you know actors go to actors and actresses go to california but they work in restaurants as waitresses and bartenders was the pro audio profession was that something that you're like i can do something within the industry do something on a regular basis to hopefully help pay the bills and and give me a little bit of a safety net of a career while i'm i'm trying to turn my passion into something was that ever thought 
Oh, for sure. I mean, from day one, I remember going into the career services department of the school I went to and the guy sat down with me and he was like, so everybody does this. This is what all the kids in your uh, class right now are doing. They go into the field of pro audio visual, like, you know, a production, live event production and yep. stuff like that. He's like, it's, it's a great way. Yes. You can go work at the studio down the street. That's cool. They're accepting interns, but they're not going to pay you. If you need to get rent paid, Go talk to this guy at this hotel. You'll set up sound systems, projectors, lighting, the whole shebang. And I've been doing that since 2011. And that's been my primary bread and butter to get rent paid. Like I'm still working at studios. I was a partner in a studio in Brooklyn for a little bit that we actually closed the doors because it was getting way too expensive out in Brooklyn. Yep. Um, but I've always, I've always had like the studio life as kind of like a backseat to focusing on live event production so that I could get my bills paid so I could get my rent paid. Um, and so that I could afford to get more gear. Um, but yeah, I've been doing that freelance since the pan, like when the pandemic stopped a hit, right. I lost all of those jobs. So, oh, it, you know, it was, it was a rude awakening. It was a little, it was a, a scary thing. Um, but it's also kind of what made me sit back and go, geez, if something like this can happen and the whole world can shut down, maybe I should start focusing on something that I build myself. And that was where like the idea of, of this new band came to be was, you know, if, if every company in the world can just drop you in a second because you don't fit the balance sheet anymore, maybe I need to really build something for myself. And like the last year and a half of cultivating this band during the pandemic, like I had the free time to put all of my force into it. Right. And, you know, with, with how all of that was, was turning out, I, I got a lot of, you know, I got really motivated because I was getting a lot of positive feedback. Um, just as you know, starting any business is, is a financial burden to say the least. It's a lot of money. I'm putting everything that I have into it. Um, as of the last like three or four months, I just started picking up some freelance gigs at a couple different event venues around the city. So I'm, I'm like, I'm just scraping by and every single extra penny that I make goes right back into this, this machine that I'm trying to build. And maybe in two, three years, I'll start to see, you know, a profit, but I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it just so that I can build this and say that it's mine, say that, you know, and, and be able to include other people in it. Um, and just the quality of what we've been producing has made an entire team gravitate toward this project and want to be a part of it. So I'm super excited because I, I feel like I am doing something right right now. I love that. And, and, and it's, and you are doing something right. I mean, and it, no matter what ends up happening, you're doing it right in the sense that you're doing what you want to do, taking responsibility and accountability for your personal responsibilities, but trying to find, you know, avenues within your career, your passion and staying, you know, staying focused, you know, in, in that, but also, you know, making a living through it all. And, and the networking side of it, I've met a lot of musicians. You do a fantastic job of, networking with, you know, like-minded people, but also just people that are going to bring something to the table to your projects that are different and unique. So when you decided title holder was, was the project, I mean, what are you seeing in, uh, you might like ska music, you might like that whole genre of music, but what makes you think it's got legs going into 2022, 2023, 2024, and what are you doing that's different? And why is it so passionate to you? I mean, I, I just have a feeling like I, you, you saw last year and the year before there's like this pop punk resurgence that I'm seeing coming, coming back. You know, you've got, you've got rap artists like, like Machine Gun Kelly that are making an entire pop punk record. And the thing went all the way to number one. Yep. Um, I know I, I'm seeing this trend of pop punk starting to have this revival and I know that when pop punk was huge back in the, the late 90s and the 2000s era, ska was just kind of like winding down. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to uh, 
I mean, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, but I really think that there's going to be a revival. I think it's on its way up. There's tons of new bands that I've discovered in the last year and a half, just through like trying to really network on social media. Yeah. But like the shows now that they're coming back, I'm seeing on online, like people are coming out and these shows are selling out and they are, they are pop punk ska events. Um, when I like one of the first records that I like CDs that I actually bought, I remember like mowing my lawn and getting on like $20 allowance. And I went and I bought a real big fish CD. This has got to be 1998, 99. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Record is called uh, turn the radio off. And that, that song that everybody knows sell out with me. Yep. Oh yeah. I heard that. And I was like, you know, I, I must've been 13 or 14, but that, record changed my life and i think put me on this trajectory that i'm on right now i had always wanted a ska band but i just never knew horn players like so i was like okay the next best thing is pop punk i can do that um and so i mean throughout my entire life i've always had like this love for ska anytime one of those shows came into town no matter where i was you know goldfinger less than jake real big fish mighty mighty boss tones anytime i saw those guys in town i would go and i would check it out and just see how much fun everybody was having just see how oh, there's an energy and- there is an absolute energy to the music you're not going to listen to a song in that genre that is not going to make you feel something right. you're going to feel something even if you are not a big fan in the moment that you're listening to it you're not turning the channel on it. You're, I mean it is yeah. it crosses all genres of music because it's not trying to be anything even it's the crank, fun. <laughs> even, even the hairy biker in the back of the room with his arms crossed has got a smile on his face. Right. You know? That's exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> and and you know, there's going to be somebody that's listening that are like, nope, nope, I hate Sky. I turn the channel immediately. There's going to be that person, yeah. you know. We and go ahead it. and go ahead, turn the channel. I don't care. But um, what it, later. Yeah, and 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 I think I think what's what's cool about what you're doing um, is. Yes, everything's cyclical, but what you're really doing is saying, you know what, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something I want to do, if I'm going to call it mine. How difficult, when you talk about the horn player side of this, I mean, it's probably why there's not a billion of these bands out there, to collaborate with that many people that many individuals with their own schedules with their own rents to pay their own projects that they're having to do it's a harder band to put together isn't it for sure for sure i mean i didn't even know where to start when it came to to finding the horn players like i was doing all these demos here and writing these horn parts on this midi keyboard you know and just kind of humming stuff and going da, 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 and stuff like that I made these demos. I sent them out to Nick Brzees, who uh, who produced. He actually even drummed and recorded the record, too. He drummed on it. Um, but I asked him, I was like, yo, do you know anybody that, like, would be interested in on playing on this record with me? Um, he said, let me look into it. And then he hit up, you know, some, like, legendary people in, in the ska scene. Like, um, John James Ryan, he plays saxophone in a band called Keep Flying. They're pretty big. They're real... Great guys. I love them so much. Um, Dave Heck, he plays trombone in a band called Aaron West in the Roaring Twenties, which is the, a, a band that is led by the singer of another band called the Wonder Years. They're an you know, international sensation. Um, and then Matt Stewart, who is the trumpet player in a band called Streetlight Manifesto. These guys are all seasoned veterans in right, the game. Right. And he calls me back and he goes, hey, I got these guys for you. They're all into the music. And I just kind of like went, what? <laughs> this is like, like, like yeah, this is like, gonna happen. All, I was like, they said yes. And he's like, yeah, everyone's gonna be there on Sunday. They're learning the parts now. They said all your parts are cool and, and they'll be ready for it. And I just kind of was like, oh, oh my god, oh, oh, okay. So Sunday comes, everybody walks in, and the energy in the room was just like magical. Everybody was so nice. Everybody was so cool. Matt Stewart is the greatest trumpet player I've ever seen in my life. Um, but these guys all did their thing all day. At the end of the day, John and Dave actually walked up to me and they were like, yeah, we love this stuff so much. We don't like, we don't want to be hired for sessions when you need, when you need players, like we're in your band if you want us. And I was just like, 
okay, it's happening. And that, oh, like, you know, I, I couldn't go to bed for like three days after that. Oh, I was like, yeah. John and Bieber in the band. Like, <laughs> I know Matt would be too, but he tours nonstop with Streetlight. Like, he just doesn't he have just doesn't know. He, yeah, he doesn't know his schedule. And, you know, he yeah. wants to, even if he wants to be there, he might not be able to, all the, all the rest of it. That is amazing. And so that, that Sunday, like, how many songs did you have at that moment that, that you worked on on Sunday? Was it just a song? So we had, uh, throughout the week, I spent a week at the studio with Nick, and we had prepared six songs that everything was tracked out, everything was recorded. So the last day was, you were listening to the full mixes of everything. They just didn't have the horn parts on them. But I still had, like, my little demo MIDI horns on them. So they would, like, basically line by line, we would go, all right, intro, three, two, one, boom. And they would hit the intro. They would do it all together in the same room. So they rehearsed it three, four times, and then we hit record and they played it together. It was surreal. <laughs> oh my God. So let me get this straight. How many songs have you released thus far for title holder? Is it two or is it three? So we That's have what two. I thought. Yeah. You, you just, just said, released. you just said you had six and I, now I feel like you're holding out on me. Why don't I have like, these other songs personally? I promise I won't share them. <laughs> I'll, I'll send them to you. I'll send them to you. Um, Dude, I, I'm a the, huge, the, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Thank you. thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, we, um, the idea was to try to get each song out four to six weeks apart. I want to give each one Mark, of these songs. Market it, give it some life, yeah. give it a chance to breathe. And I also just wanted to try to put some video content to every single one. I feel like people are, are, are faster to click on a video than, hey, check out my new song on this MP3 link. So I've been trying to do that for every like professional, like really well-produced video. Uh, my girlfriend and I do like a DIY one. So we're, you know, she's, she's as much of this project as I am. Um, she does all the designing, all the, all the, Every single photo that you see is is through her, um, but we're doing that. So we self-produce a video, then we get one really done with like a whole team of people. Then we self-produce one. We're working on the second one right now that will be out um, end of November. But I, I really wanted to try and get something done or out for Halloween. It just, it wasn't lining up. So rather than put out a new song, I did a behind the scenes video for the, the single that we put out, Animal. Um, and it's all in studio footage of what we're talking about right now. So after this, you know, for anybody who's listening, if you check out Title Holder Music on YouTube, you can see that we just released a behind the scenes all in studio it's like the funnest footage that you could ever watch and it's all real it all happened like you can't you you can't not be excited about it it's very cool matt what what is next for you you know other than releasing the songs that you've got cooking and doing some of these videos what is exciting and what do you what are you looking at as as the next you know whether it's the title holder project or the next matt sullivan uh direction What's next for you personally? I mean, the big thing that I'm focusing on for 2022 is getting out on the road with Title Holder. Um, I'm right now talking to four or five different bands from all over the country. I don't know if it's going to be in the cards next year to do any West Coast runs, um, but I'm trying to set up right now just for like financial reasons, just weekenders, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But I want to do one. The objective, and it's on my dry erase board over here, is one. Well, then person. it's real. If it's on a dry erase board, it's real. It's happening. It's happening. <laughs> I have right. to look at it. I have to look every at it day. every single time. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, yeah. So, so we're, we're trying to organize some weekend runs with, you know, prominent bands or not, not, I wouldn't say prominent, but like local bands in different areas so that, you know, I've got some friends in Maryland that we're trying to. You're wanting to, to get the exposure. At. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Also, we just confirmed our first actual live appearance. Um, it's going to be on new year's day, 2022 at uh, the Amityville music hall. And that show is with John, who's the saxophone player, his other band, who's going to be headlining, uh, Keep Flying. There's a band called Driveways, another band out of Chicago called Rare Candy. And we're going to be the supporting act um, opening that show. But it, it's like the hometown hero show. They, they, they tell me every year besides COVID year, it sells out and it's going to be a crazy time. So 
hopefully, uh, you know, I know, I know it's not going to be as crazy as a sold out room in Milwaukee, but it's going to be the next best thing. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the new music. I'm excited for you to send me those uh, releases that haven't been released yet. Really excited for that. And, uh, you know, it's been great to, to, you know, get to know you better through this podcast. Great for people to get a chance to see what that process is, what the project is. And, uh, man, I'm excited for what's next for you. You've got the energy, you've got that drive and everything that you do, you've got that, that high level of give a shit behind it. And that's what, that's what, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by what you're doing. Um, every time I see or talk to you, I, I walk, walk away being like, man, I, I should be doing something more than what I'm doing. <laughs> you just bring it, man. And I thank you for that. And thank you for being part of this interstate of music podcast today. I, I can't I can't thank you enough. And also, I can't wait to come back and hang out with you guys in person. That was a, such a fun experience. And yeah, bring some of those horn guys months. with you. Get some of those oh, horns here, man. I've already been talking to everybody. Everybody's so jealous. They were like, "Dude, we you, you guys went out and did that. Like, we got to get title holder." I was like, "We'll do it. We'll do it. Just, just relax. Come on." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, thanks again for being part of the Interstate Music Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is Matt Sullivan, title holder. Pay attention. Go take a listen, and uh, man, these guys are going to be something big, and uh, it's all going to be because everybody's listening to me right now saying that these guys should be big and they should give a listen. You're going to grab them. You're going to hold them. Title holder, Matt Sullivan. This was the Interstate Music Podcast. Thank you for listening. Peterson out. <laughs>